So my name is Stefan Foss. I'm in the product management, data protection division. Uh, and we have productized something that we've already been, you know, pretty much engaging with customers with uh, for over a year. It was more of a consultant-led engagement. So we have a lot of experience with customers, their questions, and I'm sure they're going to come up today. Uh, but suffice it to say, this is an area that everybody <laughs> cares about. And so, therefore, we see a lot of demand, and, and there was clearly a, de a need to really productize this. Uh, and that's what we're going to show you, and we'll do a quick demo to really walk you through the capabilities. Now, probably first, you, you kind of want to want to get an agreement. That's what we typically do with the customers on the threat landscape. And so this slide actually has sources in the bottom, so uh, happy to share those. But ultimately, uh, you know, the story we, we see here is that while financial breaches or the, the types of breaches that are financially motivated are clearly on the rise, Right? And they tend to target financial verticals, um, you know, healthcare, those are the top two verticals. It's clearly not the only thing that customers are worried about. So we, we know that there's data <coughs> theft, we know there are other types of attack vectors, but the ones that corrupt customers' data, in other words, they make it hard or impossible for you to do your transaction processing, whether that's patient flow, whether that's a trading application, that has our customers' concern. And that can be an insider, right? It can be something like Petya, which wasn't a ransomware attack, but uh, a wiperware attack. It really doesn't matter so much what the attack vector is, but the outcome is what uh, our customers are concerned about. But according to the data breach investigations report, most of them happen to be financially motivated. And the biggest category in there is ransomware. So there's clearly some sort of hype around ransomware, but I just want to you know, make clear that that's not the only thing. What's bothersome and wor worrisome about you know, the threat landscape in general is it's not so much that the number of ransomware attacks always <clears throat> tends to go up. It actually ebbs and flows from year to year. But the amount of variance right, that the bad guys use keeps growing. So it's kind of an agile development that's really happening. There's a lot of toolkits you can find in the dark net. And so therefore, it's pretty hard to always keep your detection capabilities up to date, right? To make sure that we have the ability to you know, catch stuff as it comes in, as it penetrates the perimeter. And this is evidenced by some of the work when you look at, so this was a secure work study. Uh, then we did some survey-based, mostly survey-based studies. Um, but uh, ESG basically revealed, or this was Gartner actually, um, that you know, most companies are not as happy uh, with their ability to detect on time and then do something about it as they would, which is why we still see pretty long dwell times. So dwell times, you can think of, you, know, you click on the wrong email, so that's typically that uh, email exploit correlation or phishing to ransomware. There's a high correlation between those. And then hackers have to spend some time on your network, right, to understand how do I compromise, how do I steal the right credentials to then actually launch the attack. That's what we refer to as a dwell time. And the goal is always to keep that small. But clearly, more and more customers we talk to realize that recovery, a recovery strategy, in addition to everything else we do across our security posture, and you can use NIST and other frameworks to map that out, has become more and more important. And in addition to regular backup and, you know, sort of data protection solution snaps, you know, there is more and more consensus that being able to recover from an isolated copy can be a very <coughs> effective strategy, right? So this is basically what we're seeing. CISOs are taking an active interest this is actually very interesting for us because <clears throat> security budgets often sit outside of the infrastructure budget, and we see some, some of these projects actually be, being funded there. So that's kind of a little bit the problem statement. And then, you know, when we look at sort of security transformation, that can mean a lot of things to a lot of people. But when we try to boil it down a little bit, typically the exercise revolves around <clears throat> if there are ways we can kind of reduce this dwell time, to begin with, right? Then that's a good thing, right? So the less time a hacker has to kind of orchestrate their attack, the better. Um, but the problem is there are some conflicting <coughs> um, requirements that we need to address in IT. We have, you know, cloud strategies, every customer we talk to, right? Mobile, IoT. And so what happens is that the perimeter is not as clearly defined as it used to be, right? We, we, we kind of are dealing with this lack of visibility 
And then oftentimes we're spread too thin just because we have the same amount of people. So having good tools that can then understand these signals and these, uh, I mean, these ransomware variants is one thing. But when you get thousands and thousands of signals every day, it's very hard to kind of sift through that. So when you look at offerings like SecureWorks that will then have their data scientists monitor events for you, that becomes a more and more uh, you know, compelling value proposition for our customer. So in other words, we have things in our family of business and offerings that can help sort of remediate you know, and kind of keep this as small as possible, tools, and then of course the mechanisms to uh, monitor. But clearly, you know, what we are gonna talk about today here is how can we help make the recovery time or the incident response time shorter than it normally is. And what we're seeing here is that often the, the roles are not clearly defined. We are, we are dealing with, yes, part technology, but also process, right? So, you know, do we have the right process to formally you know, engage with the right people in case of an incident response? And then how can we make the data recovery effective? That's often an afterthought. That's specifically what we're gonna talk about here. How do we take some time out of there? So you don't wake up one day and say, oops, I got hacked, and then how am I gonna get my data back, right? So that's basically the piece of the NIST continuum we fall into, recovery, incident response. Now, when you look at sort of what happened, this was a very devastating attack, and there's so many on the news every day that basically you could just pick one, but I thought this was a particularly interesting one. Not Petya, happened in 2017. It was a nation state attack. So that's uh, what we know. <coughs> and essentially the payload, the malware, was persisted to a part of the operating system, right, Windows Exploit, which was then embedded in a bookkeeping so software. So every customer or every company that used that bookkeeping software uh, was impacted. So it was about 60 companies, I think organizations worldwide, that were affected. And so one of the things it tells us is you don't have necessarily have to have a nation state or a bad guy be after you. You can become victim to this just by a su supply side you know, injection. Collateral damage is becoming a big problem. <laughs> so you say again? Collateral damage is becoming a big problem because yeah. a lot of these things stuck in that same problem. They got out of the targeted bounds and a whole bunch of other people got picked up in there. Exactly. And what, what made it hard here is unless you have very good static code analysis tools or process for that, you're not going to catch it. it. So it's kind of like a zero day, right? And then, you know, then it basically makes its way through the network, right? So the, the, the rate, this is one customer we help recover um, and other vendors, uh, you know, it basically spread in about 18 minutes. And the implication here was that uh, 17 factories came to a standstill. They were running SAP supply chain management systems. They were a supplier of tape media, so tape meaning little tape, storage media that ends up in cell phones, and that's a real-time manufacturing process. So it was very painful, and therefore it did cost them quite a bit of uh, sort of foregone revenue, 15 million per day. Um, you know, and then the clock is ticking, and the goal is, of course, always to get back on track as fast as possible. You know, there's the brand damage, the fact that they had to stand up 300 emergency beds just for the recovery, all this adds cost. Uh, but clearly we all understand the impact. What's interesting here is actually not so much that the, the, the SAP instance that was running on Oracle, that was running on a Linux was down, but it was the, the terminals, the, the Windows-based systems that allowed you to inter engage with these systems that people were locked out of, as well as the servers that hosted you know, a countless uh, you know, information like phone numbers. So in that incident response, you know, how do I get a hold of Jim? You know, I, oh, it's on the, on the server, I can't get access to it. So it also surfaced that while we can try to solve things with technology, process is very important. So disaster recovery runbooks, you're all familiar, but you know, if you think about a cyber recovery runbook, you know, this is clearly something that uh, you know, this customer then subsequently implemented, right? Because just that lack of coordination and that shock, you know, what to do first, second, and last. One of the things that, um, was I guess good here is that we had an isolated copy of business critical data. Uh, it was on tape, okay? So therefore, uh, you know, there was some data that was intact that we could use for basis of recovery. The problem is when they did the estimation of what it would take to do the recovery date directly from tape, it was gonna be weeks. They did 
summons it prioritized. That's what you would do. Uh, and then they did the recovery in that sequence. In some cases, it failed. I mean, this is just the nature of the game. But we had the ability, because they already had a data domain and networker, to use a process to accelerate that recovery and at least get the benefit of the faster media you know, recovery speeds of the data domain, which at least took down the recovery from a couple of weeks to four and a half days, right? We don't want to operate that way, but luckily we were able to solve it. So when you think about cyber recovery, in a nutshell, what this is about is we just want to premeditate these things that we had to work through here, right? Not try to have to build, rebuild a backup catalog, as an example. Have a copy you can't get to, because the good thing here is this company wasn't targeted. I mean, they were a victim of a collateral damage, to your point. But when customers target organizations more and more, we see them going after what they do is they evade the endpoints, clearly, when they know, oh, you're running McAfee. I'm, it's a silly example. But then they know how to evade so they can extend their dwell time. And then what they'll do is they'll go after your backup <coughs> storage and your servers. Right? They did this at Sony. Right? That was the first documented attack on a you know, backup and storage system. So. <clears throat> You know, isolation can really help, but we want to do it in a way that with the recovery can be quicker than it would be from tape and more reliable. That's kind of what we're trying to solve for, okay? Um, and this is where we, where we also try to make, set some expectations. We're not trying to replace disaster recovery or existing, a, an existing business a continuity continuum or data protection continuum. We know you're using snaps. We hope you're using replication. We hope that you're using backup, right, for all the reasons we understand. The idea is typically with a cyber attack, the nature of the disaster is a different one. So we're not trying to solve typically, right, for the zero RPO or zero RPO type scenarios. This is what we encompass here, right? So if we can get that as close to zero, great, but typically cost and other factors and distance limitations may get in the way. But what we want to have in addition is the ability to at least have that last line of defense. So if we do it once daily synchronization inside a uh, cyber recovery vault, that's not a bad thing, right? Because at least I can get data back. And, um, you know, clearly the, when it comes to the recovery, we're not making the assumption that you're just going to do a bulk fail back of one data center to the other. That's what you would typically do if you have a disaster that's regional, data center outage. But it's going to be selective. Right? And then oftentimes iterative. Your security folks may say, hey, can you restore this, this specific VM? I want to run some analytics. So it may be an iterative process, but ultimately the goal is to make sure it's good and then we get back to the healthy state in production. So I think that's always important because sometimes people get confused and they say we already have this. Yes, we have this, but all of this is also connected. So in theory, it is also exposed to the hacker. If you are concerned, Right, that this is fair game to some extent. You need to start thinking about isolation, but you're going to have to compromise on some of the other goals like uh, RPOs and RTOs. That's basically the talk, what we try to express. <laughs>